This is captured by Women, an all-women current affairs show which examines critical issues from the perspective of women. I am Matilda Abahames, a communications expert. My name is Nancy Vukania and I'm a management consultant doubling in agribusiness and fashion. Now, here is a quick recap of our last week's show. We have seen that they can't do it for 18 years. Mm -hmm. So we are calling, we are going to call um, the Destiny Day demonstration within three months if the government From hasn't now. done anything. Yeah, the okay. Destiny Day the demonstration means that mm -hmm. if one law, the law that protects the common trader, that uh, is being uh, forced to pay all taxes and all that, the other taxes, the laws in taxes works for us. The Destiny Day demonstration means that they're going to be total chaos. We are going to close the shops firstly, and this is going to solve the problem. And within three months, we are going to see that. Thank you. Thank you. This program is sponsored by Woodin, Woodin Le Create. You can follow us on Woodin Fashion on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Also, the program is sponsored by Emerald Suites. This week, we look at government suspension of the concession agreement with power distribution services. And this happened on Tuesday when the announcement was made. There's been several developments to this effect, including the pre-contract and lack of due diligence, which have come up strongly. Up for discussion today is also uh, the Founders Day celebration that comes up on the 4th of August. Um, a lot of controversy has gone on regarding uh, the question of uh, the Republic Day and they're changing it now to the Founders Day. We will get into that discussion. And also on Monday, the Finance Minister presented the mid-year budget review. And so we look at the aftermath of the presentation and what has happened so far. The spin is up next when we come back from the break. Welcome back. This is The Spin. On Wednesday past, the Minister of Finance's um, request for an additional 6.4 billion Ghana CDs expenditure was approved by Parliament. And then on Thursday, Parliament discussed other aspects of uh, the budget, such as the ESLA and uh, the Communications Service Tax, and uh, which has been increased from 6% to 9%. I wonder what all this means to the ordinary Ghanaian. Somebody will ask, uh, what has this got to do with the price of kenke? <laughs> <laughs> and it's a very interesting one, yeah. because I keep asking myself, would that be passed on to the consumer? Yeah, um, obviously it will. I mean, when it comes to uh, communication, um, it's one way that you can tax everybody, more or less, in the economy. Because as you know, almost um, the entire population has access to mobile communication, if you like. Um, uh, about 20 or 30 percent are exposed to uh, data communication, which is the internet. So it's a means of actually getting around the entire population you know, in terms of taxation, but somebody like uh, uh, Kofi Capito, who is the mouthpiece of consumers in Ghana, would say that this is a lazy man's way of um, raising revenue from the population. But it tends to bring a, quite a little bit of concern here because you realize that um, the vehicle, luxury vehicle tax, mm. which had seen a lot of uproar, a lot. had been taken off mm. or scrapped. And so you ask yourself, was it scrapped? So or was it just reallocated? Or reallocated. <laughs> uh, interesting times ahead because yeah. um, you look at that, you look at another increment in tax or levy for on petroleum. Yes. And so once you buy a gallon, it's about 20 pesos put on it. Yes. Um, what is the transportation operator going to say about this? Well, they, they said that it, it hadn't been increased above a certain threshold. It was just a 5% or so, so it didn't require necessarily an increment in transport cost for the ordinary Ghanaian. But labor unions are asking for an increment in salaries to yes. push in the worker because um, it's been an erosion over the mm. past year due to a lot of developments. It depends on what GPRTU comes up with. Um, last time uh, that you know we contacted them, they they were yet to meet 
you know, with uh, the authority and with those in charge to see if they were going to increase. So, I mean, that will come up. And the, the thing with fiscal policy is that it hits you two or three days <laughs> after it's been approved. You know, it's, it's so quick. You know, that's, that's how it differentiates from monetary policy because that's more or less, you know, policy, more or less uh, paperwork. And it takes quite a while, uh, things like interest rates and things like inflation. But, but this, this translates to you very quickly. Absolutely. It's, it's almost, you know, I said... That's the reason why you ask, what does it have to do with yeah, a ball of yeah, yeah, because It's got a lot to do with it. And, and you know, not, GPRTU doesn't necessarily even have to come up with communication to, to their members. And people already start increasing fares anyway. You know, it happens with, especially with the trotros, you know. They just go ahead and say, oh, you are to petrol. Yeah. So automatically then it goes up. So the Kenke seller has to pay more for transportation. So automatically then she's passing it on to her, her, her buyers. Well, obviously, these are ones that you don't um, see coming in hugely. You, you mm. don't see the money that you're paying, but obviously you're going to be paying for the taxes yeah. and the levies. So um, we, we just have to brace ourselves. Yeah, but, but I, I, for one, you know, don't think that the, the, the vehicle, uh, you know, luxury. the luxury vehicle levy was a bad tax at all. I think it just wasn't properly packaged and it wasn't properly executed, if you like, because um, it exists elsewhere and I feel as if we just picked up the concept from somewhere but we didn't really package it as we should have. I mean, the person that drives a Ferrari or a Bugatti, it's not the same as the person driving a Toyota Tesla or, or, or let's say uh, uh, a, any a, of the a basic truck, cars. any of those basic trucks that people use in their farms and so on and so it's not the same there's a way that we should have done it you know where we we tick certain boxes not just engine capacity i think that was quite shallow in defining what a luxury vehicle means it should have been executed at points of entry and then when you're going to renew your roadworthy certificate that was fine but um, i think it should have been packaged more uh, efficiently and then it could have worked because i feel as if clearly like you said it's just been put in other places and i think we're going to feel it some more this time everybody else is going to feel it including just... the person in the village <laughs> everybody 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 mm. okay. all right viewers uh We've just finished with the spin and uh, we've discussed the budget and its aftermath. Uh, share your thoughts, share your views and uh, go on our social media at TV3. Coming up next on Captured by Women, the PDS and government brouhaha. Government has suspended the concession agreement with power distribution services. Since Tuesday, when the announcement was made, there has been several developments to this matter. Key among the issues coming up have been pre-contracts and lack of diligence. Was government negligent in the agreement process? In here to discuss this is Dr. Kwabna Donko, former Minister of Power in the Eswal Mahama administration. You are welcome. Thank you. So, was government negligent in this agreement? More than negligent. Why? Why? Because the guarantees, the two guarantees that today the same government says are fictitious, were conditions precedent. Exactly on the 3rd of August 2018, when government brought this to parliament to be ratified, we raised issues about the guarantee. Oh. The Parliamentary Select Committee on Mines and Energy, of which I'm a member and also a former chairman, insisted that we wanted to see the guarantees. The government, led by the Ministry of Energy and the representative of the Ministry of Finance, said, oh, the guarantees were in place and that they will submit these guarantees to Parliament for our scrutiny. We reminded them and they were never submitted to Parliament for our scrutiny. The leadership of Parliament, the majority leadership, exercised um, their option and said, okay, let's take their word, they will bring it, let's ratify so that there's no much further delay. But oh. on the assurance that they will submit this to Parliament, they were never submitted. The concession was handed over on the 1st of March. So we're talking about a request made by Parliament a year ago. A year ahead of... Time. Yeah. 
and it was condition precedent. We're going to hand over our assets worth close to $2 billion to an entity to manage. It also includes cash flow. Cash flow in the teens of millions per week to an entity. We say, look, give us the assurance that this um, assets we're handing over to you are in good hands. The value of the guarantees will be about $500 million. We said, yes. And they don't give us the guarantee or they gave us some guarantee that we now turn around to say was fictitious. Hmm. How long does it take to do due diligence? Okay, so let me ask this straight on. You are talking about signing an agreement. Yes. What would be the process for us to sign, apart from these things that you were asking about? Because I would think you would need someone, the person you are signing the agreement to tell you that if I am not coming, or whoever the person is, you would have an authorization note, or perhaps um, um, a charter to tell you that this is who will be recognized. You see, this so, um, private sector participation arose out of Compact 2. And I'm afraid Ghana was set up for this scandal. Okay. I see, yeah. It's unfortunate, as I'm a professional, I should never be saying this uh, without considering the seriousness of the issue. But you had World but Bank, you had IFC. World Bank was not involved. It was IFC. IFC, yeah. IFC I think, was in charge of the due diligence. Yes. It was not in charge. Okay. IFC, IFC was a transaction advisor. Okay. Your advisor cannot take responsibility for your own. Because apparently mm. they're saying that IFC gave the go-ahead, so Please that's why. Please, advice anywhere oh. is not binding. First of all, advice is not binding. Okay. And therefore, you cannot say, because I was advised, I didn't do due diligence. In any case, IFC itself was conflicted in the transaction. IFC was a consultant to, to uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation. I, IFC was a consultant to the Electricity Company of Ghana. and was a consultant to MEDA. IFC oh. itself was conflicted and oh. had raised these issues before. Okay. Far back as 2015, 2016, I raised these issues. So they are, that is not new. But that is not the Were issue. Were we restricted from doing our own due diligence as a sovereign nothing, state? Nothing, nobody restricted it. We were expected to. Yeah, but some other people are of the, of the view that, you know, we, we, there was a time factor and we were limited by time. Hence, the rush into Please. this sort of deal. Uh, it's cock and bull. <laughs> we want to shift the blame. The blame to bodies that at best their blame should be secondary. Okay. We have primary responsibility. It does not take more than three working days in today's world to do uh, due diligence. You have a, an instrument, whether it is a standby instrument or a direct payment instrument, it could be a letter of credit, it could be a standby letter of credit, it could be a guarantee. Right. There are systems in place, there are institutions in the settlement institutions that will verify this mm -hmm. in less than three working days. Oh. So where is the question, where does the question of time, the come, time in? come in? They came to Parliament, Parliament ratified this on 3rd of August 2018. So where is the time? Oh. Look, I say this whole thing was set up for a scandal because of even the tendering. Oh. Before the change of government, the terms were that companies that, uh, that there should be an inter international competitive bidding oh. and that the consortium must have minimum 20% content. local content in the consortium. So a number of big boys, including EDA for France, a number of big boys came in, joined the tender, oh. and then come change of government suddenly Ghana comes back to say, no, 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 we are no longer accepting 20%, but one fifty one percent Immediately, you, cr you cross that 50% mark to 51%. The company is no longer an international company. No. It becomes an indigenous company, yes. by definition. 
And who were the uh, entities in this new indigenous 51% holding? There were entities, none of which had any expertise in power distribution. Yes. Cobbled together about overnight. Five, yeah, about five. Cobbled together overnight. Mm. Is it surprising that we didn't do due diligence? Who's and we have time. Who's would it have been to do the due diligence? First and foremost is the Minister of Finance. Mm. The Minister of Finance is the shareholder of ECG on behalf of the good people of Ghana. All right. The Minister of Finance signed the compact on behalf of the Minister of Ghana. So first and foremost, the Minister of Finance should be held responsible for this, for the damage to our international reputation. Mm. Secondly, there's a sectoral minister who oversees the sector. ECG falls under the sector. He brought this to parliament and he assured parliament that the documentation will be made available. Mm. So he should have responsibility. MIDA, the statutory body we set up purely for this, under the office of the president, mm. what were they doing? No. They were driving the process in terms of day-to-day -day execution under the supervision of mm. the mm. two ministries. Mm. The attorney general, the attorney general is the chief legal advisor to government. No agreement. Uh, mind you, compact was not an agreement. No. The Americans agreed it was an agreement. It was a treaty. Okay. How could we operationalize this without the Attorney General ensuring that all the boxes had been taken? Uh -huh. Collectively, we either went to sleep, <laughs> we're either inept, uh -huh. incompetent, or playing greedy. Because, then, I mean, this is so childish. To, and mind you, we did not discover this as a result of any due diligence. I challenge anybody who says oh. we discovered this as a result of due so, diligence. So what was it? Mm. We got, got a tip off on the 16th of July. Okay. From, from where? From a gentleman based um, in Qatar. That is okay. the letter they are referring to. Okay. Okay. Okay, because so we, we got a tip of on the 16th of July. The how long did it hasn't left actually? It hasn't left. They're how long here. did it take us to even announce? Two weeks. <laughs> even after the tip off. So what stopped us from announcing it? Well, the same thing that stopped us from, from doing, doing the right thing from the white go. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's no look into the composition of the 51% mm. group. That is where the whole problem comes in. Okay. And the best okay. in so that so now, now, now we have spilt the milk, but we are looking at ways to remedy the situation. What is the best way to remedy the situation? The people involved should all stand aside. Having okay. superintendent over this mess, we expect the same people to rectify the mess. In any other serious political jurisdiction, heads would have ruled by now oh, okay. as a matter of honor. How do we get out, out of the mess? The compact, technically, is dead. Where we got but into, my, technically. My worry is what we stand to lose as a country. Because the biggest loss is mm. the loss of reputation. It's not even about the money. Okay. A whole country, Ghana, the black star of Africa, we cannot even verify a guarantee. Before going into... We hand yeah. over an asset worth billions of CDs to a nondescript entity with no track record. And then we can't even verify the guarantee that was presented to us. Is the visit to months. our court likely to begin to remedy a situation or... Do we have to it. visit there? I doubt today, we have to. In, in the 21st century, do we have to, century, to. Yes. We have to ver visit to, to do verify, verification? Yeah. Bank of Ghana could do this in a day or two. <laughs> I'm, what I'm, happens I'm between us and MCC with um, this anomaly? With this anomaly, uh, I will be surprised if MCC does not pull out. It will only be because they themselves were culpable mm. in a way. Okay. In that, in imposing IFC on Ghana, on Ghana. 
And th that is what Ghana government must bring out. Look, IFC was imposed on us oh. because they claimed there was a time, that time frame that this thing must be done. And when we raised, I raised this, I, even as minister, that why should the same entity be a transaction advisor to MCC, to be a transaction advisor to government of Ghana, to MIDA, to, to ECG? But does this mean that if, if we lose out, we may lose out on Compact 2 at this point? It's a possibility. It's a possibility. It's not a certainty. It's received over $300 million. Yes. Mm. So that, that means that we will lose out on Compact 3 then if we are not able to go through with Compact 2. Well, we'll, ha we'll have to do some serious uh, introspection. Can we do without the Compact? The Compact itself is not injecting much. Not that much when you look yeah. at the. The Compact itself is not injecting of, much. You know. It's the leveraging. Yes. Having created this mess, can we look for a silver lining? PDS should never, never have been given the facility. Oh. Look, when the big boys like EDF pulled out, because look, if you now tell me that I cannot have majority equity interest in the concession oh. because Local companies must have 51 percent. The reputational damage, yeah, because I lose control in the boardroom, right? So, that all the big boys pulled out. pulled out, they were left with two companies this one and the BXC. Yes, we disqualify BXC, <laughs> so basically, we cook it. We for have one company. So even the benefit of international competitive tendering, we lost we it. Lost it yeah. So that do, with the case that we were making for local content, with this development, can we still stick to local content? Not fifty-one percent. Not fifty-one percent. So what percentage would be ideal? The original was twenty percent. So that at least as a country. We get a look into the boardroom. Right. With 20%, we have boardroom representation. With 20%, the local entity will be able to learn from, from the, foreign the foreign entity. entity. And the requirement was not just any foreign entity, an experienced right. an operator with experience across different jurisdictions. We threw all, our, all that out because we wanted a particular company to have it. You've asked for the officers who supervise this to stand aside. Yes. Where do we begin from and with who at this point? I named them. The first person oh, is the Minister, Minister of, of Finance. Finance. <laughs> the second is the Minister of Energy. The Chief Executive of MEDA. Oh. The AG. The AG. The AG. The AG is the chief Quite legal severe. advisor. <laughs> the AG ought to have seen to it that all the boxes were, were ticked. ticked. Even, even that notwithstanding, people are worried about uh, the return to the Doomsaw era with this scandal. Um, it shouldn't cause a return. Okay. It shouldn't cause a return. I can say on authority that as a people, we have mismanaged the energy sector. Mm. If you look at the figures the Minister of Finance was quoting, those debts are, are not energy debts. No. More than half of those debts are owned by government to ECG, MDAs, who have not paid their bills. So it means ECG hmm. doesn't actually need anybody to help it manage uh, itself? No, I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't be say that. You see, this public sector reform program was initiated in 1994. Hmm. We are where we are because we lack the balls. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we lack the political will to do the things we on our own have committed to doing. Mm. We started in 1994. Cabinet approved the public sector reform program in 1995. Mm. That led to the creation of Gridco. Transmission was taken away from VRA and they then we established Gridco. There was a, a ECG was supposed to be broken uh, up into four or five SBUs, special business units. Mm. 
and the ECGs have become a holding company. So these companies become competitive, introduce far Generation, more commercial competition into, into them. Distribution, okay. In the distribution arena. Mm. We also have a wholesale market. That legislation has been passed. The Allies Energy Commission has done the work. Yet we still lack the will. We have dealy dallied. Operationalize it yes, properly. We have dealy dallied because as a people, we are intellectually lazy. I'll say it again. <laughs> we don't want to think through an issue. We go for the easier solution. I'm, I'm hoping that you know we can get through with this uh, and then be able to still finish with the Compact 2 so we can benefit from Compact 3 because Compact 3 has a lot to do with infrastructural development and it might help us to deal with our excess generation. You see, again, the excess, the excess thing we talk about mm. is just political convenience. Okay. Look, right now, Valco is operating only two port lines, yes. nearly two port lines. Yeah. There are three port lines idle. Mm. Those three port lines, a port line consumes 75 megawatts. So 75 times three, that is already there. Yes. We are saying one district, one factory. Assuming the factories had been built. We would need the energy. We would need the energy. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the 5,000 being bundled around is wrong. Mm. And I've stated that again publicly. Look, we have some plans that are technically past their sell-by date. Mm. The mines reserve plant, the two small plants in Tema, Tapco in Takrade, these are absolutes. Mm. And then, as if this is not bad enough, a government says, look, 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 we have excess. Assuming, without admitting that we have excess. Some of the existing ones that are due to expire, do you go to extend them? No. <laughs> there is no logic to what we do. It's more about political convenience. But do you agree that these problems have existed? For a long time now. They are you not were in new. Government before. They are not new. Yes. They are not new. For example, the indebtedness. We want for a whole euro bond. We spent part of the euro bond paying for electricity. We set up ESLA. We yes. use part of ESLA to pay pension. Yes. We lack the will to carry through what we commit to do. Okay. So back to um, PDS. And, the concept, <laughs> and, and this whole buhaha. Finally, as you leave us, what word of advice do you have for governments of which you yourself are part of as yes. the legislature? We must at all times put the interests of Ghana first. Mm. There is a cabal that have monopolized the energy sector mm. and refuse to let intellect, other intellectual thoughts come mm. into it. And it's become politically so expedient to play football with it. But energy drives the economy. Energy drives development. The people of Ghana have also been too docile. Excuse my language. We have allowed people to play what in my hometown in Yeji will call Chaskele <laughs> with the energy sector rather than have a program committing to follow through the program, and even before the past, thinking through the program. Mm. For example, government comes, 70 to 80% of all the payables in the energy sector are dollar denominated. Yes. The 90%, 90 to 95% of the receivables are CD denominated. Mm. So that in itself causes it's a problem. Yeah. A new government can say, I've reduced tariff. Mm. So the balance sheet of Deficits, the entities yes. expand. The deficit expands. Now we come back to say, oh, there is energy sector debt. Yes. Didn't we know there was debt when we were reducing? <laughs> I mean, what were we thinking? Yes. Looks like we go around in the same circles. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Kwabna Donko, for coming through to explain further and giving us insight into this. The pleasure is mine. Yes. Had Dr. Kwabna Donko, he's the former prime minister in the Eswal Mahama administration.
Coming up next, 4th August is a Republic holiday to mark Founders Day. We have special guests to help us understand the issue. August 4th would henceforth be known as Founders Day. This comes after government tabled an amendment to the public holiday Amendment Bill 2018 in Parliament. How relevant is the day and is it even necessary? We are going to look at the argument for and against. In here is Professor Kojo Gavua, an associate professor of archaeology and heritage studies of the University of Ghana, Legon. You're welcome. Thank you. Is it an apostrophe that makes the difference as to who the founders are or who the founder is? Well, the apostrophe makes a difference, but the fundamental thing, it's beyond the S, where it lies. It's about the attempt to rewrite Ghana's, Ghana's history. Um, I would say that we are shifting from what we may refer to as public history to popular history. Okay. Popular history being history which those who rule us, the ruling elite of any society would package for the consumption of the citizenry. Public history is history that is out there. Uh, those in the streets know what the history, their history really is. Now, whether it is necessary or not, well, every nation should have a history, should have something to hold on to. But at this stage of our development as a nation, I don't think that the debate should be shifting from the basic things that concern the nation, food, shelter, clothing, and so on, to who founded the nation. Because uh, when I was growing up as a young man, uh, a few years back, it was obvious that uh, Kwame Nkrumah was the founder of that's what we all grew up to know and anytime i travel outside this nation many people still regard him as the founder of our country uh, it may be the technical founder because he was the spearhead of the movement and events that led to ghana's independence but it is also true that there were so many other people who partook in the activities that culminated in this nation's independence. If we want to shift from the Founders' Day, being the day of the day celebrating and commemorating Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, to Founders, that is those, a collection of people who, whose work led to Ghana's independence, then I think that we must broaden it beyond those who are recognized today as the Founders. Oh. I, for example, I don't see any woman in there among the founders oh. as if women did not uh, uh, actively part. participate in the activities that led to, to Ghana's independence. What about the soldiers, the ex-servicemen who sacrificed their lives? What about the workers in the streets who suffered during the colonial period to create wealth uh, that... But, but, but in, in sending this to Parliament and the reasons given, the presidency indicated that this signifies a collective effort of recognizing our forebears towards a founding a free, independent Ghana. That is very true. But who are the forebears? If you say our forebears, oh. that is what I'm saying, that our forebears go beyond those who are recognized mm. today as the founders. You know, when we talk about the founders, then they are going beyond Kwame Nkrumah to include uh, people like uh, Dankwa, oh. Bechebe Lamte, and the pa Big Grant, Six, Pa yes. Grant, and others who are referred to as the Big Six. But I am saying that if it's founders, then we have to expand the bracket oh. to include many important people many important people whose activities, whose efforts led to the independence of our nation, including women, including workers, farmers, traders, ex-servicemen, 
minus, and so on and so forth. Oh. Uh, but short of that, then it, it appears as if we are only recognizing a clique of people, an elitist group, um, whose work probably uh, was not in the interest of the majority of Ghanaians anyway. Okay, mm. so we, we, you mentioned the fact that we are trying to rewrite our history. Yeah. Are we writing it for uh, positively or this is going to affect us negatively? Well, in the short term, it may be positive for those who are rewriting it because it serves their interest, it serves their cause. If you write popular history that serves factional interests or serves certain tendencies, in the long run, it will be rewritten. Oh. It's like uh, having a monument. If the monument appeals to only a faction of the citizenry, that monument would be invulnerable in the long term. So if this history is history that appeals to a cross-section of Ghanaians, then it will stay. But I see this history as one that will be rewritten again. And the question is, how many times are we going to rewrite Would our history be ourselves? Would it reconciliatory for us as a country? Because we are looking at moving forward and ensuring a developed country. That is exactly the point. Is it reconciliatory? Uh, once we have controversy, this particular day is contentious. Many people have spoken against it. Oh. Okay, uh, that is why it is not reconciliatory as it is supposed to be. I don't think we had anything wrong uh, with the Founders' Day as we had it celebrated. But to have a new Founders' Day with a shift in the apostrophe uh, becomes contentious. <laughs> I, uh, that I, is what I'm saying. But what, what is the contribution? I, I, I'm now? thinking that um, there was nothing wrong with celebrating Republic Day. For example, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that you know, uh, celebrating, for example, in Christmas birthday on the 21st of September, is equally uh, great. Mm -hmm. What I think this was intended to do was rather to include all of the important people that you mentioned. Do you not think so? Exactly. I, I am not against Founders Day. Okay. Okay. With the basic understanding as explained to Parliament. Mm. But I'm saying that if we are going to celebrate a collection of people whose efforts led to Ghana's independence mm. beyond one person, then the bracket must be widened. You think the bracket is too narrow? It is too narrow, extremely narrow, <laughs> and it's only limited to the elite of the period. I'm saying that then we have to include important farmers, right. important market women important ex servicemen mm. exactly important miners those who sweat and blood actually led to our political or uh, let's say legal, legal independence, independence because economically we are still not independent <laughs> <laughs> so what happens what, what is happening with your institutions that have to rewrite our history mm. and so if we are rewriting it and we want to rewrite it and not come and rewrite it again mm -hmm. Then the inst this, there are institutions who should make sure this doesn't happen. Yes, there are institutions, uh, the humanities of the universities, oh. of the various universities, should be at the forefront of writing, revising, and rewriting our history. But where there's a disconnect between the academic institutions, the intellectual base of the country, and the political institution, then we have such problems. Because this, some of us see it as a purely political decision without input from the faculties that need to digest the issues carefully and recommend to the politicians to work on. And that is the, the so, challenge so this, we have this, today. This goes to say that then there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect. So what's the way forward then? What would the you, way forward... As, as, as an academic, what would you advise? The way forward this? is this, that we do much more research yeah. into all the agencies, individuals, other institutions whose activities led to our nation's independence if we want to retain the founders day as currently construed. Yeah. But if it's just to downplay the role of one person, Osajifo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and to import 
other names into it. That is why I say that then it is not very meaningful. It, seems it becomes politically charged. Yes, politically charged. It serves parochial interests, wow. which may not benefit the generations of Ghanaians, Ghanaians to come. And in that regard, others may attempt also to rewrite, to rewrite, to rewrite that history. That, that's why I think Tilly's has the most concern because <laughs> you, you can't keep, you know, it's like a pendulum. You, you change it today, so somebody else comes to change it. It's like what they've been doing with the educational system and, and many other things, you know. So exactly. Changing, yeah. You see, life and uh, what we refer to generally as culture is dynamic. We don't expect that our history should be frozen in Static, time. Static, yeah. You see, because once you write history, you are freezing activities and events of a particular period. Yes. So necessarily, history will always be rewritten and revised. Mm. For example, much of what we know about ourselves as a people is something which is not our story. It's the story of other people. Other people describe us, describe our past, and documented it. So it is time for us Ghanaians to tell our own story. Mm. I agree with that. But when the story is told or retold mm. to serve factional interests, That's to serve the interests of a few, mm. particularly a ruling elite, whose activities may be disconnected from the majority of the citizenry, then it's problematic. Yeah. I can agree with okay. that. Okay, so it, does this go a long way to affect us internationally? Because internationally, we've used Dr. Kwame Nkrumah um, a lot to gain some kind of currency in a lot of things. I don't think this will have any effect internationally. Mm. You see, because uh, the international audience is much more well informed than we are made to believe. Uh, I mentioned earlier that when you travel across Africa, I just returned from Tanzania. Okay, and then elsewhere. I was in Egypt, I was in Uganda, I was in Nairobi, I was in Senegal, just to mention a few countries in Africa. And then beyond the continent, when you mention Ghana, the first major name that comes is Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah's Ghana. Mm. Okay, so whatever we are doing here, I think it's just uh, to tickle our fancy within the country. <laughs> Internationally, it won't have much effect because the truth stands. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Professor Kujo Gavua, Associate Professor of Archaeology and Heritage Studies at the University of Ghana. Thank you for coming through. And thank you too for having me. You're welcome. So Nancy, what's your high point for this week? Well, um, we have talked about a lot. We've talked about the PDS um, ECG debacle, and um, we, I'm, I'm hoping that you know a scandal such as this will not sort of uh, you know put us in a bad light internationally. I'm hoping that we can recover from this, and um, at this point, uh, we should be able to work through. Um, uh, going through the Compact 2, you know, so that we can advance and become beneficiaries of Compact 3, because I think, you know, that will support us even more in terms of infrastructure when it comes to energy. Uh, what's, what's worrying is that um, uh, people are just not taking responsibility for what has happened in terms of the negligence uh, with the due diligence before we went into this treaty. So um, looking at what the public has come up with, what the court of public opinion is saying about all of this, I'm hoping that the people that, uh, you know, intended to commit fraud to the state will come up themselves and resign certain positions, you know, the chief executives and so on, you know, so that we can bring in people that are more well-meaning, if you like, you know, for, for, yeah, who have the interest of Ghana at heart, for, because for, this is quite disastrous. Th this should be a lesson to us as a country, mm. for us to take our sovereignty seriously. Yeah. Um, we also have to look at the fact that when we go to the negotiation table, we go with the right technical people yeah. and also ensure that ahead of time we do the necessary consultation with the right people right. so that you, you'll be able to tick your boxes 
and know what exactly you should do. And I'm perhaps sure even have do. these people on the team itself so that by the time you finish with the agreement, you know Ghana is walking away with so much yeah. rather than a little. You know, the national interest should be what should drive us singularly. singularly. And yeah, I mean, that's for me is what I am taking away this week. And, and also I think that uh, this thing of amending of contracts and treaties should be brought to the fore because it looks like things were done, you know, under, under you know, the table and, you know, uh, the, especially, let's say, the local content bit, which was moved from 20% to 51%. You know, when did that happen and why did it happen? We do not know. So for me, I think that, you know, we, we require more transparency and accountability from the people that we put in government to serve us. As far as I'm concerned, this is a call to service and we have to put much more value on that than, you know, the issue of being in power and, you know, enjoying all, all that comes with it. And um, another long weekend is, 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 <laughs> is upon us and uh, we're celebrating Founders yes, Day with the apostrophe in the front. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. That, 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 that yeah. bit, rewriting our history, yeah. I, I think we should just leave it to those who have to rewrite it, the so, academics, mm. the people who write, the institutions who have to write mm. our history. Um, because they take into consideration the things that have happened. They do the legwork. Uh, they all do the, the legwork. And, yeah. and because it's something that should unify us rather than to tear us Divide apart. Us, There's it? been so much buhaha about this. And Most people don't agree with this, actually. They think it's just a political job, you know, to include, you know, some people in our past or some members of, you know, past governments and so on. And... And like the professor said, you know, it's, I think if, if we're going to include, then I think we should include this everybody who was part of, of fighting for our independence. He talked about ex-servicemen, he talked about prominent women. But how uh, do we who, put all these people into one pot? Um, Can one just signify it? Yeah, I, I, thought, I thought that Republic Day was fine to signify all of that in a collective sense. But, well, it looks like it's been changed and... Um, uh, we, well, we don't have much of an option, do we? No. We have to deal with it. We have to deal with it and enjoy the holiday. <laughs> enjoy the long weekend. <laughs> <laughs> well, viewers, make a date with us next week, same time, on Captured by Women. My name is Matilda Abahins. My name is Nancy Vukania. And our sponsors have been Wudin Wudin Le Create. If you want to look good, smart, visit our Wudin Boutique Nationwide today. You are offered a wide range of authentic African fabrics and ready to wear clothes and um, follow us on Wooden Fashion on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Also we have been hosted by Emerald Suites, beautiful spaces for beautiful people. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs>